Hamilton. We're live yeah. in Studio B, your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan, the man that Matt Reynolds was blocking for, Riley Nelson. Protect this man. Former BYU quarterback is now joining us to look ahead to what we believe, Riley, is just an unbelievably important game as BYU prepares to go into a bye week and they look for their first Big 12 win. So let's start with this. How would a win versus a loss on Friday night impact the trajectory of this season? Because it feels huge to us. Yeah, uh, I do kind of agree with the point that it's an inflection point, mostly because it's a game that BYU feels they should win. And everybody was feeling confident last week that after having knocked off Arkansas on the road, confident that you could go into Lawrence. And I... I think anybody that was paying attention knew that Kansas is not the Kansas fold, right? It's not the Charlie Wise Kansas. It's not the football doormat that only cares about basketball. They knew they were a good squad. But again, if you can beat uh, Arkansas on the road, you can surely go into Lawrence and, and do that. And uh, so to come away uh, playing how they played where two things. One, continual frustrations in the run game. I know you guys have, have covered that in a lot of ways, but then also giving a, allowing their defense to score 14 points, which I mean, was the margin of defeat was less than 14 points. Right. So in an essence, feeling like you gave the, gave the game away, it has people questioning this, a Cincinnati team that's struggling coming into the Edwards stadium on a short week where you probably would have chalked this off as a confident, you know, Cougs are going to get the win. Now people are iffy. So to me, at least from a morale standpoint, look, the reality is, each game is its own uh, entity, right? So you take it game by game, week by week, game plan by game plan. But it's from a morale standpoint, from an emotion standpoint, this fr tomorrow night is definitely an inflection point for the season. I was saying during the summer, there's no way BYU loses this game. Certainly the percentage of confidence I have in that has waned a bit given what BYU's not been able to do in the run game and whatnot. But I still think BYU wins the game. So where do you feel like BYU has advantages against Cincinnati? I feel that defense, their defense versus their offense. I feel like the defense has been incredibly stout. They've been incredibly physical. I've, uh, of course, we all had hopes that Jay Hill and Coach Papinga and Sione Pua and all these guys were gonna were gonna do this, but it, it's proved. Has it been perfect? No. But do these guys, you know, have they recruited uh, recruits tailors tailor built for their schemes? Not yet either. They kind of took the existing and granted there. We know there was a lot of turnover, 50 plus kids, you know, new to the roster, but still it's a lot of the same. It's a lot of the same names uh, that we're seeing make plays. And of course, players make plays no matter what scheme they're in, but there's been an attitude shift. So I think there's, there's an advantage there. And then I also think there's an advantage night games at home, night games in general, but night games at home, uh, BYU is incredibly tough. And I hate to, I normally try and pick something a little bit more detailed and schematic that actually has to do with the play on the game. But um, the way that I do not believe, and I know you guys have discussed this on your show and you were just discussing it in the previous segment. Like, I don't believe that you can abandon the run game. I don't believe that just giving up and your strategy being to throw the ball 40 or 50 times is a, is a positive path forward. So while the offense is still trying to figure itself out, its identity and trying to establish some semblance of a rushing attack, I do think that you have to rely on things like a Rock and Lavelle Edwards night game uh, to give you an advantage in a contest. Riley Nelson is on BYU Sports Nation. Let's say BYU can't establish the run game, and it, it just kind of holds steady as to what it's been through the first four games. They're rushing for, you know, around two to two and a half yards per carry. Maybe they put up 50 or 60 yards for the night. Not good numbers. Ugh. How in the world does BYU still beat Cincinnati if that is the case, and it could be against one of the best defensive fronts that BYU is going to see all season. Uh, so I know we don't like to mention our neighbors to the north on this program, but it, for anybody <laughs> that watched that, and granted it was at the same time, right? But I was I was switching back and forth. I mean, it's a future conference opponent. I had to do my scouting. <laughs> there you <right>? go. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Utah had some similar struggles. They couldn't get the offense going. Um, or the rush game or the pass game. And granted, they had a freshman QB and all that, but what was the difference in that game? It was 14-7, but the Utah defense had scored a defensive touchdown. And you look at the you look at the Kansas game, right? It was Unfortunately, it was two defensive touchdowns that BYU gave up, but ultimately, you take away those two defensive touchdowns, 
Um, and, you know, BYU has the advantage of that game. Of course, you can, nothing boils down to one play, but from a strictly point standpoint, I think that might be the blueprint is that if I'm a defensive leader on this team or even a coach, I'm saying, guys, it's time for us. We All right, we've, we've hardened things up. We're playing more physical. We're playing more assertive, downhill, aggressive. Now it's time for us to start impacting the scoreboard. Let's start putting some points up on the board um, by taking the ball away and, and having a party in the end zone. And uh, so I think that would have to form part of the equation. The other part of the equation is um, – I, I would put the onus on the offensive staff to, all right, if the run scheme are not working, what are pass plays that can act like runs? Um, it's hasn't, it's not traditionally part of uh, Aaron Roderick's uh, deal, but we haven't seen as, I, I feel like we haven't seen as many fly sweeps. Now, maybe we don't have as many fly sweep runners, but getting the fly sweeps involved, whether it's bubbles, whether it's now screens, getting the balls out to your wide receivers in, in space to where it's, you're not putting Keaton Slovis in a position where he feels like he has to be a hero putting the ball down the field. In my opinion, that for sure led to the second interception that he had against Kansas. But I also feel like it's an overall pressure that he feels that he has to bear to constantly push the ball down the field. Well, if handing the ball off's not getting us uh, some easy yards and setting them up and some second and third manageables, we have to change our game plan, a little bit of our identity. And I think the offensive, uh, I think Roderick and staff can do that through the screen game, maybe a little bit more emphasis on, on a fly sweep, but taking some pressure off Slovis, even if he's still throwing it, they're high completion, no risk of turnover, and uh, lessen the sense that he has that he has to win it all by himself. No Parker Kingston, likely, doesn't help the fly sweep game. Maybe it's Keelan Marion. We, we shall see. Regarding Keaton Slovis, how would you assess how he's played so far? And if the BYU run game struggles, like Spencer uh, mentioned, and, and we're hoping it doesn't, but if it does, can Keaton Slovis throw BYU to a win over Cincinnati? It's just going to be extremely tough because even as great as Zach and Jaron have been in this system, they were at their best, at least as far as chunk plays. Like, if I, one thing that I would like to see out of this offense is, is more chunk plays, but historically and under coach Roddick chunk plays come off the play action and the play action only works when the defense, when the defense feels threatened by your run game. So the fact that he, uh, I'm not going to harp on the run game, but I'll talk about a, a byproduct of that, which is the fact that he hasn't had his full complement of play action passes to be able to generate shots down the field. And he's kind of been, uh, you know, contained into um, a set of plays that a defense feels a lot more comfortable preparing for. I feel like, uh, you know, he, he has a passing grade for sure. Um, Jaron Hall was one of the best quarterbacks at keeping his composure, not turning the ball over. You, I, I felt myself being frustrated with Slovis's turnovers, but realizing that that's, if you look at him in a vacuum, as far as quarterbacks go, he's still, he still takes care of the football very well. Just not as good as Jaron Hall, but Jaron Hall was literally one of the best to ever do it as far as, um, you know, keeping his composure and protecting the football and do that. But I'm rambling a little bit here. I, I think he's done well. Football is the ultimate team game. We all tend to focus on the quarterback. When things are going bad, we all tend to look to the quarterback to solve our problems. You know, when things are going good, we tend to give all the credit to the quarterback. But it is the ultimate team game, all three phases. And then within each phase, you know, the 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 skill guys are dependent upon the linemen. The linemen are dependent upon the skill to do their job. So uh, one, you know, one man can cannot win it all, and I, I think we should hesitate from putting it all on Keaton Slovis's uh, shoulders and in, in trying to do that. That's a weighty opinion, and from a quarterback, no less, Riley Nelson, bringing it on BYU Sports Nation. Okay, let's put you, and I know that you, you don't, like you said, you don't want to harp on the run game, and, and that's certainly not the purpose of this, but. You, from where you watch this BYU run game and the running backs working with the offensive line and just the whole scheme of the offense, if you were in control, how would you jumpstart the run game at this point of the season? Because you can't overhaul it. It's, it's been, they've had this in since, you know, the spring. Like, they, they have yeah. had this implemented for months now, so you can't just – a fan's like, well, just do something different. Run the I formation. It's not that simple. How would you jumpstart what BYU has been trying to do and setting up since last April? They're in an extremely difficult position because you have to try things new. And anytime you try something new, especially in a game scenario, you have to give it more than four or five or six cracks at it, right? But 
if you give four or five or six cracks and you get three yards in those six carries, I mean, even the most loyal of Cougar fans, are pro- you don't want the Boo Birds to come out on Friday. I just talked about how important it is for that crowd to make a difference in this game on Friday night. Like you cannot, as an offensive coordinator, lose the crowd by continuing to, to give uh, an effort to the run. But here's what I'd say. And I haven't been able to watch the, you know, the all 22 or see the lineman view from the end zone, right. To, to see the old film that we used to see, but I get the sense that th- for whatever reason, these backs in this offensive line are not executing that wide zone. That was a staple um, of previous BYU, previous recent BYU offenses. So you look for other schemes that are still in the playbook, you know, whether it's a power scheme, whether it's an ISO scheme, more man blocking as opposed to zone and see if, if that can do that. The thing you like about man, man blocking schemes as opposed to zone, it requires less coordination and a little bit less um, athleticism. It takes some of the pressure off the linemen in that they have a man assignment in a zone you have an idea pre-snap, but like once the ball snap, that can all change. And that's when you really have to rely on your combo blocks and you have to really be reactive. Lyman, basically they give you the front pre-snap. Everybody gets their targets and then you have your guy, go get your guy. So it can simplify a lot of those things, but that you mentioned not overhauling BYU has been a predominantly wide zone run team, but they still run power and they've still run ISO. So what I would try perhaps is more ISO and power schemes into the run game to simplify it for your offensive line it a lot once it, their assignment's simpler it allows them to focus more on being more aggressive playing on the other side of the ball and it also can clean up some reads because the running back isn't reading as much in a zone scheme you could go anywhere from you know going outside the tackle all the way to the backside a gap in man schemes it is designed to hit a b or c and uh so uh and, and if you play it with the right attitude it's no more simple to defend for a defensive front. So th- there's my, you weren't asking for the, <laughs> the full master's level. Oh, oh, I wanted it. I wanted it, Riley. I love it. I wanted it. I love it. That was great. Okay. I quickly looked up play action versus no play action for BYU the last couple of years. 2020 play action versus no play action plus 2.6 yards per play for Zach in 2020, 21, 1.4 Jaron Hall uh, also in 22, 2.6 this year. It is negative 2.3. BYU is better in no play action than play action. Your point is validated by that number. BYU needs more play action. Okay, I want to ask you about this. The night thing with BYU. 25 and 3 when kicking 6 p.m. or later, 14 and 13 before 6 p.m. What is that? What should we make of that? Uh, so obviously everybody talks about, you know, how old they are and how these guys all have, in my opinion, they're <laughs> BYU because they, because they have those kids. Cause they are married. They're used to those late nights. The baby's crying. You got to go get the formula. You got to mix it all up. <laughs> so they are, they're comfortable also guys. Um, so I, I gotta tell you a funny story. I was yesterday we were, and I know we're getting to the end of the segment, but, um, I try and intermix cartoons with like, I love wildlife show and they have this one on national geographic called up close. And they did one on cougars. So of course I rallied all my boys and my little daughter around. I was like, watch the cougar. And it was down in Patagonia. So this cougar was stalking and hunting a llama and it took him like four times. (laughs) And I literally told my five-year-old son, I was like, this is what BYU has to do in the run game. See how the cougar, (laughs) he didn't get the llama the first try, but he kept trying. He eventually got it. That's what they have to do. But the reason why I say that is the Cougars were hunting at night, man. We are BYU yeah. Cougars, and they are nocturnal hunters. That's uh, that's about all I got for you is why we're so much better as night as opposed to the day. Let's go. Uh, I, yes. Cougars hunt at night. Cougars Let's hunt go. at night, nocturnal baby. Nocturnal Cougars. I know. It's, a, it's impossible to explain it, but it is what it is. It's a crazy step. Oh. It's crazy. Riley, great to talk to you, and we appreciate the master's class and the thesis that was on great. the run game. That was Tremendous. incredible. Tremendous. Great stuff, man. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Always a pleasure. Hope you're well, and hope you're enjoying some additional family time. I know that's important to you, so we're, we're, we'll, great, we're grateful we'll to hear that. We'll send you the all 22. <laughs> okay, great. Love it. I'll watch it with my five-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Riley.